Hey guys, according to the BBC, about 25% of under 30s who took out their mortgages this year started their mortgage with a 35-year mortgage term. In addition to that, the FT, the Financial Times, and I, and I quote here, reported saying that mortgage terms in excess of 35 years have become much more popular amongst first-time buyers in the past year. At the start of 2022, about 8% of first-time buyers had a mortgage term longer than 35 years. And by the end of the year, this had risen to 17% and rising. For today's video, I want to explore the implications of these ultra-marathon mortgages and what they mean for our lives, not just today, but, but also for the future. In addition to that, just wanted to highlight that what we're effectively seeing is a trend that will have huge implications for the future. Young people, Gen Zs, Millennials, and some of the Gen Xs are effectively buying houses at insane prices right now. Some are even having to be forced to buy much smaller homes naturally as a result, but they're doing it by taking these debts for much longer periods of time and at effectively indebted for the future. So I want to unpack what this means using a real life example, a live example, to help us really understand the numbers so we can better make more informed decisions for ourselves and our own families and households. If you're really enjoying today's video, we really, really appreciate it. If you hit that subscribe button, that one thing really, really helps us. About 56% of you guys who watch our videos regularly are currently unsubscribed. You might even think you're subscribed because you watch our videos all the time. However, you're not subscribed uh, according to the data. So we'd really, really appreciate it if you literally take a moment to hit that subscribe button and show some support for our channel. Now, here's the example I want us to explore. Kate and Adam are both 29 years old. I'm reading here from my phone so I can quote you the exact facts. They're 29 years old and have been saving for a house for years, okay? They've worked really hard. Now they've been able to buy a house, a three-bed house on the outskirts of London, and they've been able to buy it for £400,000 and have put down a 20% deposit. This means that they've borrowed £320,000 and let's, let's, um, looking at their rates here, they borrowed at a mortgage rate of 5.5%, okay, on a repayment basis. Now, although they were fully aware of, you know, the 25-year the mortgages that have always been a norm for a while, uh, for many years, they chose a 35-year term because they wanted the numbers to work for them. They wanted the affordability, they wanted to be able to do it without feeling too much pain. Now you might think, well actually, that's okay, that's pretty normal, and it is, as a trend indicates. However, this points to a growing problem. And what's the problem? I'm gonna explore the costs first, and then in the second part of this video, I wanna look at what we can do as potential solutions. So let's look at costs. The first cost is the cost of money, okay? Now, since they went for a 35-year mortgage rather than a 25-year mortgage, those additional 10 years have huge implications. So a 35-year mortgage, the interest, the mortgage interest payable over the term of that mortgage works out to be, in that example, £389,827. Now, ordinarily, when people see that on their mortgage documents, they're just like, yeah, it's just a number. It's a big number, right? And they just ignore that right? However, this 35-year mortgage has a monthly payment, in this example, of £1,718 per month, right? That works for them, and they can afford to pay that. However, if they had gone for a 25-year mortgage, they would have needed to pay an additional £247 per month, so their monthly payments would have been £1,965 per month. Now, wait for the mortgage interest bit. The mortgage interest over 25 years is £269,524, all things being equal for simplicity. This means that their decision to go for a 35-year mortgage over a 25-year mortgage has a whopping £120,303 additional in mortgage interest payable over the term. Who does this benefit? Now, of course, you know, it somewhat helps the people who are borrowing the money from a flexibility perspective, but the main winner here is the bank. So where all the various participants in the marketplace are making it very easy for you to simply make that phone call and say, 
hey, increase the term on your mortgage. Remember that ultimately the one person who's rubbing their, you know, rub, rubbing their palms together is the bank because you're going to be more indebted for longer and that's good for the bank. Now, obviously the, um, the huge change in interest over that term happens because of the power of compound interest. Now, this power of compound interest helps us, as we talk about on this channel all the time from an investing perspective, want to invest for money to work for us, but it also works against us when we are in debt. Now, this doesn't stop from the cost of money perspective because there's another cost tied to the cost of money that we don't think about often. This cost is related to the fact that although the long term for a mortgage, so the 35 year term for the mortgage, helps first time buyers get their foot on that ladder, it also inhibits them from being able to climb that ladder because the majority of their payments each month will be going towards interest payments uh, rather than towards capital, capital being paid off. For the example I gave you, here are the exact numbers. If in that example, Kate uh, and Adam, in their example for the 35-year mortgage, 85% of their mon monthly payments will be going towards interest alone. Had they gone for a 25-year mortgage, it would have been 74% in those early years going towards interest payments. So first cost is the cost of money. The second cost is the cost on your well-being. It goes without saying that when you take out a long-term mortgage, 35 years and beyond, there's a natural cost because you're going to be working for longer to pay that debt back. And as I've mentioned, there's a huge implication, implication from a money's perspective. But there's also something else from a well-being perspective is what happens when your job has a threat to it. When you feel like you're going to lose your job, you're going to be made redundant. And what have you? And I've seen this for real, for real. People have deep fear about losing their jobs when they have mortgages, particularly when it's a huge mortgage and the, th the term of that mortgage is huge as well. This piles on a massive amount of stress. The third cost is the cost, is the opportunity cost. Naturally, if more of your money is going towards paying for property and paying for a mortgage, you have reduced contribution to things like your pensions and other areas of spending that you might have ordinarily in your life. And if obviously, if wages, if your wages are not rising as much, um, to keep up, then you might find yourself in a trap because you still have to pay that mortgage. At the same time, you also have the, the, the negativity around the fact that you're not saving and investing enough for retirement, which is counting, which is you know, kind of piling up that pressure as you become older. The fourth cost is the psychological cost. Now, one thing I've learned from having a mortgage myself is that there is a huge psychological burden that you have when it comes to a mortgage. And that burden becomes bigger with a 35-year mortgage. It just feels like you've got a massive weight on your shoulders that you cannot shift. In fact, that weight, that psychological weight becomes so big that it actually might demotivate you from even trying to pay down or pay off that mortgage any sooner because you just see that amount of debt as just being so insanely high that it becomes almost impossible for you to act and do something else. And then this then feeds into other areas of your life because you might become somebody who becomes, uh, who doesn't take, um, who doesn't want to take any risks. And that inability to take risk might then start to affect other areas of your life more generally. Now, all of this points to a to future problems effectively for people to who have ultra marathon mortgages. And I want to just Take this time to highlight what those costs are. And next, I want, I want to now talk about what the benefits and what the solution, poten potential solutions are uh, that, that you might want to consider. If you are somebody who's trying to get on a property ladder or if you're somebody who's currently on a property ladder who has a, a really long term for their mortgage, I now want to explore what those options are. But before I do that, I want to just take a moment to talk about something that's super special to Mary and I. Uh, we've been running The Humble Penny for about six years now, and we had the incredible opportunity of writing our very own book with the second largest book publisher in the world, Hachette, and their imprint, Quirkus. Uh, you know, very, very notable in the UK, our book's titled Financial Joy. Uh, thank you so much for everybody who has pre-ordered that book already and really got, uh, got us very, very excited about the prospect of this book really getting into people's hands and helping them to transform their lives financially. The, the, the subtitle of the book is that the book's there to help you to banish debt, grow your money, and unlock financial freedom in 10 weeks. It's a 10-week plan 
to help you design a life of financial joy, which is a life made up of a balance of wealth and well-being. So I'm going to link below and above for you to head over and, and pre-order the book on Amazon. And, and I, honestly, I cannot wait for the book to be in the hands of so many people because it's literally the best work that we've ever created. And it's the thing we've been working on so quietly in the background over the last 12 months. So yeah, definitely check out the link below and above to pre-order on Amazon as well as anywhere else you are in the world. That link um, gets um, uh, is custom so you can find right wherever you can buy it in your locality. Yeah. All right, now I want to look at potential solutions. So now I've talked about the, you know, the issues with these ultra marathon mortgages. What are the solutions? Solution number one is that you wait and don't buy until you can afford to own a home without paying away more than 25% of your net income each month. Waiting is a good thing to do, okay? Now, here's what the BBC said, and I quote, it says here that nationwide said that someone earning an average income and purchasing the typical first-time buyer home with a 20% deposit currently spends would spend 38% of their take-home pay on their monthly mortgage payment. This is higher than the long-run average of 29%. So there's clearly an issue here, a growing problem in that more and more of people's kind of take-home pay will be going towards paying for mortgages. What we would say here with this example in terms of a potential solution is literally wait and, and see how things pan out. Save, save, save and get to that point where you ultimately want to be in a position where around 25% of your net income goes towards paying your mortgage and then you have some breathing room to be able to overpay if you needed to do so. That's number one. Option number two is to buy smaller and cheaper around where you live. Where you live. I'd personally avoid flats. You know, I know there's a, you know, flats remain um, uh, affordable to a lot of people. And I've been through that on that journey of, you know, owning a, a flat and what have you. But I, I honestly don't like flats in the sense that from the perspective of service charges, they have, they're, they're, just, they're just uncontrollable. And you always feel like you're not, you, you can't budget as much because every year something's always been added and things keep, keep going on. And then there's, you know, there are all the problems we've had in historically with flats, cladding and what have you. And I get it, you know, the people who will always buy a flat and people who like flats and people who can only afford flats, I get it. But if you had a choice, I'd personally avoid flats if you can, personally. But, you know, and of course you can buy flats that are not with service charges. So like masonettes and what have you, but yeah, just wanted to put that out there. So option two is to buy smaller and cheaper around where you live. Option three is to move further out. That's what we had to do. Yeah, I couldn't afford to live in London, personally. Uh, if actually saying that, we could have stretched and bought, but we chose not to because we just didn't want to borrow that much money. So we moved out of London, moved to the outskirts. So you might consider doing that, moving out further to try and buy a place that you can actually afford realistically or even consider doing what other people have done which is to relocate entirely some of our friends that we know have relocated abroad because it just made more sense for them from an arbitrage perspective to earn an income in the uk but live somewhere else where the cost of living just makes more sense but obviously that's a huge decision to make and you may need to consider that person for yourself option four is to rent rent is obviously an option and remains a legit option um although a lot of people almost think rent is such a horrible thing to do. I understand that rents are very, very expensive, and but will not be for everybody. But for some people, renting is an option. In fact, um, I'd highly recommend watching a video we made uh, called Why You Should Not Buy a House, okay? Which is part one, and we made part two, which is why you should buy a house, because they speak to different people. I'll link to that video, the first one and above, on why you should not buy a house, on the pros and cons of home ownership versus renting. Definitely go and check that video out. Whilst, whilst you're there, make sure you watch part two as well. Now, to the rent point, though, I do want to mention that it's worth mentioning that having a 35-year mortgage, as some people will argue, is better than renting, because at least you feel like you have some control in some capacity over how much you're paying each month. Just wanted to mention that. Option five is to buy with a 35-year mortgage, but overpay aggressively. So we get that some people, the only way they'll get on a property ladder is to buy with a 35-year mortgage, or even more than that. However, do not sit on that term because it's costing you every single day because interest rates remain high and compounding is work, working against you. So in the example we gave you earlier with Kate and Adam, it will take an overpayment of £247 per month 
for them to wipe 10 years off their mortgage and reduce the term from 35 years to 25 years, £247 per month. And they could do this by adjusting various aspects of their lifestyles, maybe getting a part-time job, maybe having a side hustle, whatever it takes, because it's worth it wiping that 100K, 120K or whatever K off how much you owe over time because that debt is real and follows you everywhere, okay? That's number five, option five. Option six is to buy with interest only and wait for an inheritance. Now, I'm going to be real, right? I looked at some stats from the ONS, the Office for National Statistics, and they mentioned in their research that, you know, different households by different ethnicities and how much they inherit. For example, some of my heritage, Black African, they showed in research that on average, they inherit one pound. And other, you know, ethnicities, whether you're white British, whether you're Indian, Pakistani, Chinese, whatever, they had all these different um, different uh, amounts, or, or Caribbean, all the different amounts that people could inherit. And the amounts were not very much. So my point here is, is chances are most people will actually not inherit anything. That's it. Most people will not. Because your parents and the people ahead of you are actually struggling right now. Some people have had to unretire because they did not save enough for their retirement. So don't bank on inheritance. I don't bank on inheritance. Even though I know I will inherit something eventually from my parents, I don't even, I don't even let it cross my mind, yeah? Uh, aside from a tax planning perspective and, you know, kind of uh, legacy planning, I'm not banking on that stuff, yeah? I'm just going to, for me, I'm just going to assume. So if this is an option for you and it's your legit only way of buying, buying interest and waiting for an inheritance, then please go ahead. But it's not something I personally wish for you know, kind of anyone in my in my household, because I just think it's highly unlikely for a lot of people. And then finally, obviously, obviously num number seven, final option is that the government needs to do more housing stock. There needs to be more housing stock because there just isn't enough, and demand continues to out outstrip supply, resulting in an insane imbalance that continues to drive prices up, as well as various policies that continues to stoke up the property market and keep prices generally higher, far outstripping people's wages over time. Overall, what I'm saying with this video really is that now more than ever is a time to be very intentional about the decisions that you are making about your mortgages. Those decisions matter. Increasing the term on your mortgage matters. There's a knock-on effect on so many different areas and you need to think about these very carefully and be very close to your numbers. The other thing to remember is that the term of your mortgage is not set in stone. If you've bought a house with 35-year mortgage or more, that's not the end of the world. Those numbers can change. You can shift those numbers around. But in, in our personal opinion, the more you shift those numbers lower rather than higher, the better off for you from a long-term perspective because it Everything, every decision you make has a knock-on effect from, you know, uh, how long you're going to work for the future, your wealth building potential, and what have you, okay? Guys, I really hope you've enjoyed today's video. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. If you're someone who's experiencing a 35-year mortgage, or if you've had to take out a mortgage for longer, please tell me a, a bit more about that in the chat, you know, why you've made that decision, and, you know, you know how you feel about that, how, it's, how you feel that's affecting other aspects of your finances more generally. If you're someone from other parts of the world, whether you're in the US, Australia, or you know other parts of Africa, or wherever you are in the world, where ultra marathon mortgages, maybe even in Japan or wherever, are a norm, I'd also love to hear from you guys in the in the comments to know, you know, what impact those ultra ultra marathon mortgages are having in where you live at the moment. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video today. And as always, people, in all things, be thankful and seek joy. Take care and bye for now.